off the mark. It's uh, White Line Fever Live. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, I have to always say, um, please subscribe and, and hit the bell and, and all that sort of stuff and like as well and like. Um, and if you're listening on the podcast, welcome back. A lot of our guests these days seem to be return guests and that's because I'm old and that's because <laughs> the show has been running for 10 years. Uh, not that the wider world is aware of it yet, but anyway, those of you who are listening, I appreciate your um, um, appreciate your loyalty and, and the YouTube channel is growing really quickly, so people are watching. Um, and without further ado, welcome back to the show from the beautiful city of Prague, Dan Reed. How are you, Dan? I'm good, Steve. Thanks for having me on today, man. It is wonderful. It's wonderful to see your face and, and hear your voice. And we're here to talk about um, Let's Hear It For The King, the upcoming album and i was going to say because i did kind of um i did do a little bit of preparation and I, I was going to say that you know um fight another day was a comeback record and origins was kind of like the um covers revisiting the back catalog record and this seems like the baby of the two this seems like it's kind of like it's kind of like got that muscle of some of the older stuff uh, not as mellow as uh, as fight another day and uh, the two singles pretty calm and starlight um, they certainly will be exciting your fans who love the sort of rockier stuff from a while back. Yes, I think you uh, you may be onto something there. That <laughs> they're the parents of this child. I think it took us a while to get our 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 groove back. You know, kind of like where we were as a band when we first started out. So when we first came back together in 2012, it had been 15 years since we had played together. So we were just kind of feeling each other out again. But this album, we had a lot of time being on the road together, um, kind of daydreaming and talking about the world, um, whether it's social issues or politics or just life, how we all, all grown as people. And um, when it came time to writing this album, it was really about bringing all the band members in to compose together, which usually we didn't have that kind of time or inclination to do that. It was more about writing the songs and sending it to the band and then going in the studio and recording it. This we spent a year sending tracks back and forth and putting vocals on it and chopping stuff up and rearranging things. I had read an article where ABBA used to do stuff like that. They sometimes one of their the most loved songs were a combination of three or four songs they put together. So uh, we did a lot of experimenting with that kind of stuff. So I hope hopefully that's what you're hearing. Yeah. Um when before we started recording i was just remembering the last couple of times i would seen you and the one time i didn't mention was at the hundred club here in london and i remember you got up and and that that was maybe after fight another day came out and and you got up and there was a review in classic rock i think by dave everly which you mentioned in the from the stage and you seemed a little wounded by it and i i think i think dave's dave maybe was a bit surprised that it w was a mellower record than a lot of people expected when you when you listen back to fight another day do you does it seem mellow to you or is it more like that's what you like and you, it's just a journey, you know what I mean? I think the hard thing for me was trans, uh, you know, transforming from my solo work, which I was doing a lot of stuff mm -hmm. with before the network got back together. And the idea of going back to like this hard, funky thing right away for me just didn't feel natural. So I wasn't definitely, I definitely wasn't wounded by the review, but I might, I like giving people a hard time sometimes, but like, for example, Dave Ling, who's one of my better friends in this industry. Um, I met him because he gave our first Dan Reed Network album a bad review. And so I asked the people at the label, I go, can you give me his phone number? Cause there was no internet back then. And I was, I, I'd love to call him. And I called him up to thank him because his insights made me think about the record in a different way so we actually we became fast friends from that day on <laughs> yeah it's funny it's funny you, often you can um over the course of t uh, a long course of time you become better friends with people that you've you know had some frisson with than people who've just always been around you Absolutely. Know what I mean? yeah yeah um well so so was gonna say um you'd mentioned sort of um the th let's hear it for the king it's not, you know, you're not, hopefully you're not bored yet. The album's not out with people asking you about the title. Uh, I know it gets, it will get very boring eventually, but um, the title, who is the king? And, and you know, is this about populism or is it just like a catchy title? What's, what's the story? No, it's really about, I mean, the song itself, let's hear for the king is about how people that have, you know, financial excess or privilege, how they can kind of run roughshod over rules of the world whereas most of us can't get away with stuff whereas 
that Jeffrey Epstein class can get away with murder, right? And literally murder. Um, but for me, the, the whole album is really about uh, kind of praising people that are willing to still embrace humility in this world, you know, like the real king is the janitor at a grade school, you know, that, that doesn't get any fan mail. And this whole album is about looking in the mirror. Are we, is everything that we're doing about feeding our ego and our bank account, or is everything we are doing um, leading toward a place where life is a little more balanced, not only with the planet, but with each other, different political points of view. I think the art of debate has, is dying a slow death. Um, people are encamping themselves in their different groups and calling the other ones the enemy. And I think that's a big mistake. So this album is really hopeful at least my intention with it was for us to look in the mirror as a band and as a songwriter and ask myself that question. Am I willing to um, kind of try to find balance for the way we're going in the future for my nine-year-old son to grow up in a world where TikTok isn't making people millionaires, but uh, people's minds and their craft, you know? That's, that's fantastic. And so would you say over the course of the track listing, like there's a balance between kind of stuff that's just fun and stuff that's philosophical like that? Or is it, is, or is there, is it a th is that a theme? What you just spoke about, is that a theme running through the whole? For record? me, it's running through the whole album, but even a song like Starlight, you could say that that's just a fun rock song, but it, the intention of it has a deeper meaning for me is, is about the, um, what do you call it? The superstardom that people are collecting on social media um, what are you doing with those 10 million followers? Is it just about um, feeding the ego, as I was saying earlier, or is it about something deeper eventually, you know? Um, so back when I was a kid, the only way you could become a rock star was be on the cover of a magazine, you know, be on the cover of the Rolling Stone. Then MTV came out, and then you could become a rock star by getting your video on there. Now you can become a rock star by just posting a 10 second clip of you shaking your butt. So it depends, you know, like what are we gonna do with all that energy? I hope that the younger generation is wiser than we were, let's put it that way. I hope they get there. And per the second week, Dan Reed, and for the, I don't know, like he's been, as I said, he was probably on the show in the first year that we, we were doing it. So we're just, yeah. we're just talking about the, um, um, you know, the, the new album coming up, let's hear it uh, for the King. And I just wanted, um, uh, well, I was saying again, before we started recording, everything looks so slick in, in Dan Reed network land at the moment. Yeah. The video, I saw the Houston, you might've seen the Houston press voted um, the Starlight video one of the top 100 videos of the year. Wow, um, I never heard that. That's yeah, cool. I, just, I just saw that. And uh, the, the website with the kind of video and everything is really striking. I guess, is this sort of the, this is COVID, this is the time that everyone had to, to work on these things, I guess. Yeah, we had, I mean, our graphic artist, Graham uh, Bell, he's like one of the best in the business and I've been working with him since my early solo stuff for about a, over a decade now. So um, he did a lot of the artwork that you're talking about. Dan Pred, our drummer in the network is a cinematographer and director of the Starlight video. Uh, so he's he's been doing commercial work and film work for 25 years now. So. All of us are really into the art zone now. I've been working on film, uh, a film project for the last year and a half. Uh, so I think when we were talking about Let's Hear It For The King, we really wanted to try to do a lot of multimedia stuff, you know, a lot of uh, energy put toward visuals as opposed to just the music. So we actually got a short film coming out uh, in a couple months, maybe three months of some of the songs, Supernova, Let's Hear It For The King video that's gonna be coming out will also be, uh, part of that film and we're turning this into a feature film that we hope to be shooting end of this year so a lot of energy going toward just creating art and the covid years allowed us to do that instead of being on the road all the time and exhausted and thinking about flights and schedules and all that we, that was gone so we just got to sit and daydream about the creative part do you kind of um ever look upon the time the band was dormant as wasted time now you seem to be out of making you're making things work for yourselves now. So I guess there are years where you could have then, or is it, I guess there wasn't as many DIY tools that you could use during that era, was there? Yeah, I mean, there was, you know, you had uh, some editing programs for film. You know, I, I did do a feature film back in the late nineties before I got into the club business. 
but it was such much more, a much more expensive prospect then. You'd have to spend like 150K to make a short film where now you can do it for 10K and just go run around with your own camera. And so that's, that's definitely better. Tech has definitely caught up and surpassed. But uh, I think, I don't think the years were wasted because what I've seen, what Melvin did in those years, um, playing with Booker T and Stevie Salas and Edgar Winter, I seen what Brian did, uh, buying property and opening a bee farm down in Honduras and writing songs for a lot of hip hop artists, what Dan Pred's done with his film stuff and Rob Dacre, who's now in the band, all the bands he's produced. I mean, he was there in the beginning of Katy Perry's early demos. He was there for Miles Kennedy and his, early, his first band, you know, producing stuff with all these great artists that helped springboard them to the next level. So and me, I was traveling around the world studying religions. <laughs> yeah, so I don't think any, any of it was wasted time. Yeah, I guess now though, you could do, you, people are in, people have got a lot of projects going at once and you've just gone through some of the things you're doing. And, and like back then also during that period, people just sort of focused on one thing more, didn't they? You know, you, 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 that's what you were. You were one thing, you know, for, yeah. for that period, you know? You know, that's the cool thing about uh, if there's any upside to these two years, you know, the downside has obviously been this illness and the many, many, too many deaths around the world and the shutdown of the economies and that. But the, the glass is half full side of it is I think it has forced everybody, no matter what your walk in life is, to focus on what's important. And if, if you have a passion to be knitting or... Uh, you know, doing graphic arts or whatever. It doesn't matter if you were a bus driver last week, you can now chase those dreams because you're stuck at home for those, for that year and a half, you know? So I think it, it was, a, it was a really cool thing in that aspect only. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I've got heaps more questions left, but, but, but uh, for the listeners, I guess uh, the only other song we can play now is pretty karma. And yeah. I'm really interested to hear about, um, you know, the origins of the song, what's behind it, how, you know, um, the story, uh, what can you tell us about the song? You know, Pretty Karma, the, the idea, I think, I don't remember where, where I even got the title, but I was thinking about all this division, especially what's going on in the U.S. I think I wrote this during the uh, Black Lives Matter protests, um, seeing how up in arms the right wing gets. Um, it, they kind of feed each other, you know, it's like when Bush was president and they did the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, there was the left wing that was totally dead set against all that massive protests all around, all around the world. The response to that was electing Barack Obama in America. Then the response to Barack Obama was electing Donald Trump. So it's, it just bounces back and forth. And that's that karma I'm talking about in the song is that the more that we focus on my team good, your team bad, that <laughs> the more we will always keep that cycle in forward motion. It'll never end until we try to find our commonalities in the middle ground and speak to those and relate to each other on our commonalities and the parts that divide us, we can agree to disagree on because I don't think it's ever gonna change. It's the yin and yang of life. You know, there's always going to be conservatives and there's always gonna be liberals and we're always gonna uh, come to be at odds with each other in one way or another, but we have many more things in common and the things that separate us. I think that's true for every human race. Sting said it in his song about the Russians, remember? Um, really interested, Dan, as you build up to the uh, release of this album, um, Let's Hear It For The King, about how much time you spent in the same room as your bandmates over the last sort of two years. Like, um, what, what's it been like? We actually haven't been in the same room since uh, January, 2020. So that's when we recorded the album and I don't think I've seen any of the guys other than on uh, FaceTime and Zoom calls. Wow. But Brian and I have been working on, we got about nine new songs that we've started on for the next album. So <laughs> that'll probably come out sometime in 2023. So uh, it's given us, uh, technology has been great for us. Wow. Well, and, and all the, I mean, the video, obviously, I mean, I know everyone says now, well, you look like you're in the same room, but, um, but you do, and and I guess the artwork on the the um, album when it comes out too, you look like, you know, you're in the same room. I mean, it's it's a miracle, isn't it? Is it is it hard <laughs> to pull off and make convincing, or is it easy now? I don't know. A lot, a lot of green screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that that video. Let's talk about that video with the fire twirlers yeah. and like, I mean, um, 
So are you each in a different room, um, you know, and that's being filmed and, and, and is, is, is it Dan who's sending, um, who, who's sending the, the instructions out to say, you've got to sit exactly here and you've got to put the camera exactly there and you've got it's, to have this behind you? Yeah, it's Dan Pred. Mm. Yeah, he's a genius at that kind of stuff. So, I mean, he does this stuff for a living for commercial work, doing stuff for all kinds of companies. And he travels all around the world to do it, Europe, Israel, America, Japan, <laughs> he goes everywhere. So he's got, he's got the uh, uh, skills. Wow, sure. absolutely, absolutely incredible. And so when do you get, next obvious question, moving on from that, when do you get together in the same room? Uh, we're supposed to be in next month, February and March for this tour in Sweden and the UK and some dates in Germany and France. There is discussion now because of all this crazy stuff that's going on with COVID again still um, about potentially moving those dates. So uh, we'll know more about that on next week for sure. Right, right. But, things uh, just keep getting delayed, don't they? They just keep getting put back and back and back. It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing because you have people that are shell-shocked from two years of this going on that uh, people aren't you know, really raring to go out there and just pick up tickets and go to shows. They, they won't really commit until a show is maybe a week or two out and they know it's happening for sure. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a, what do you call a double-edged sword for bands that are traveling from the United States, which, you know, 90% of us are, I mean, I'm in Europe, but the rest of the guys are in West coast. So you have tremendous expenses with uh, flights, hotels, booking buses, stuff. That's a lot of stuff. That's not refundable. Um, so you have to kind of weigh it out. What's the best idea. Should we do this when things are a little more relaxed in people's minds about getting together in a sweaty room? So, yeah, 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 that is, that, that is, that's a really, really tough uh, um, to deal with. Um, I was going to say, um, um, how do you, or the, when you all get off the plane and you all haven't seen each other since January yeah. 2020, like, how do you, um, do you just click straight in? Do you, are you able to just go to a, um, a sound check and bang, or do you need to rehearse or what is it? What, how does it work? Well, we have kind of this rule that if we haven't played in six months to nine months or some or a year, somewhere within a year, we rehearse a sound check and then we play the first show. If it's wow. been a couple of years, which this has been, we will book a date a day before the tour starts to rehearse for, you know, six, seven hours, something like that with a lunch break in between. And especially this tour, because all of these new songs that we've only played in the studio once. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we want to run through those. Um, I, was, I was, before we go, I just was watching, you know, um, an interview you were doing in Manchester, I think it was, and uh, I've learned to say it the English way now, I don't say Manchester. Like an Man awesome. uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and, and you were talking, and they were talking about, you know, Derek Shulman and talking about the first album, the second album and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, and I know you were recording, uh, you were performing an album in its um, entirety then. So it's totally a perfect, appropriate thing to ask about. But it is like now 5% of the band's career or 4% mm -hmm. of the band's career. And so everyone has to learn to process the fact that your audience is focused on that four or 5% and you're trying to still be um, creative. Yeah. Um, how do you, how, how do you process that in, in your own mind when, you know, you, 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 you're coming out on these shows next month, hopefully I'll go and see you and you're excited about new material and yeah. yet you know that the people there um, um, are, are, um, are focused on stuff from 30 or 25, 30 years ago. And not only that, but when you first got back together, it was kind of like, it was, it was still kind of fresh in your mind. So mm -hmm. it's kind of okay for them to be focused on that but yeah. it's not so far removed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you process that in, in your own mind and are you comfortable with that sort of situation, you know? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think that uh, we've all found a new love for our past, you know? Like, I used to hate playing the song Tiger in a Dress, for example. I always thought it was the most embarrassing song I'd ever written. Um, <laughs> and it probably still is, still is. But I've learned to realize that, you know, the past is our past. It is our foundation of where we came from. And so no matter how many times we have to play Rainbow Child or Stronger Than Steel or whatever, that um, we try to play it like it's the first time we've played it. So it's always fresh in our mind 
we enjoy it. We don't sit there and go, oh, God damn, we got to do this again. Um, we never get into that frame of mind, whereas we used to get in that frame of mind when we were in our late 20s. Right. We used to go, God, do we have to play this again, you know, bitch and moan about shit. We got to open for the Stones tonight and play Tiger Address <laughs> with the hills going on, you know, that ego. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so now it's like, we just feel tremendously fortunate that we get to still play music. So the old songs we love playing. Um, the thing with the new songs of this new album, this is the reason why we're so uh, focused on getting new videos out and getting them out early and that people get to hear the new music. So it's not just some kind of boring new song that people are hearing for the first time at shows, that they actually have heard it quite a bit and they love the new music. So that's kind of, we'll probably play four or five new songs out of a 15 song set. Mm. So I think that's the, the fine balance point there, spread it out over the set. Yeah, yeah. Is there something from back then, you know, one of your opening, an interview you did on MTV or, a, um, um, or you know, a support slot with, uh, you know, with, with the Stones or whatever that is lost, like, and you'd love it to just turn up one day on YouTube, you know, that you just want a fan to, to produce it one day. Is there anything that you'd love to see again? That's interesting. I can't. There's quite a few interviews I did back then, um, some up in Sweden. I remember doing one on a sail ship, like an old a boat from 500 years ago type ship. And I would love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's got that, I think somebody shot it on one of those big VHS cameras that sits on their shoulder back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And tell me, I was just reading about it, and I'll let you go. Um, the tour in the early 90s, I think it might have been 91 or only maybe 93 with the baby animals. Oh, uh, yeah. Oz, when yeah. things maybe weren't going so well with your record company, you know what I mean? And you sort of got away to Oz and got on a tour. And can you, yeah. what, what do you remember of that? I just had the best time, man. That tour was fantastic. And the baby animals were excellent live, you know. And then Susie and I hung out a little bit for, I think, about half a year. I flew down to Australia to see her. And then we didn't spend that much time together. We just, we ended up becoming friends and then we split. And then, um, yeah, I think the Baby Animals tour was probably why I want to go back to Australia so bad. I had such a great time meeting people down there, seeing the Gold Coast, going up into the Blue Mountains, which is one of my favorite places in the world, um, seeing Melbourne and Sydney. And I just I can't wait to go back. I hope, yeah. I hope. This COVID rule stuff that's going on in Australia is like really intense. So who knows what's what's our next step going down there? Yeah. Well, when you were describing the you know the first song, I thought maybe it was about uh, Novak Djokovic. You know, <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it for the king. You know, um, but um, yeah, apparently U.S. citizens have been um, warned or been told not to go to Oz because of the prevalence of of COVID, which is crazy when you consider how they dealt with it to start with but anyway that is a whole other subject which that is another subject won't go into. <laughs> um let's finish up with another song and i think you said that the third one we can play is is uh the title track let's hear it for the king dan is there anything more you want to add about the sort of background to the song yeah well you can play that i guess it'll be when when it's released i'm not sure the date yet but that's uh that's a song that i wrote the lyrics for uh about 15 years ago and then Brian James, the guitarist, fell in love with the track when we were demoing, what, demoing new songs for this album. And he said, dude, send me the vocal tracks. And I want to see, I, I have an idea. And he came back with this really cool EDM track underneath of it. No guitars, just electronic music. And I was like, Brian, that's sick. You know, same tempo, but just total different take on it. So then I added guitar parts and tied up rock it up and zeppelin it out a little bit so you'll hear it since i sent you the tracks but yeah i that to me is the uh consummate track of this album and where we're heading as a band for the next record or two is that track kind of speaks to everything that we're focused toward direction wise 